morning, everybody. Uh, once again, my name is Gianluca Pegoraro, and I'm from the High Throughput Imaging uh, Facility at the National Cancer Institute, NIH, uh, in Bethesda. Uh, and uh, my goal today uh, is to give you a very brief overview of high throughput imaging, try to convince you that this is an extremely uh, powerful and flexible technique. And in order to do so, I'll first uh, give you an introduction about the technique itself and then uh, show you two case studies, uh, two assays that were developed at HITIF, uh, just to uh, provide you with a practical example of the potential of the technique. So what is high throughput imaging? Um, high throughput imaging, um, sometimes also known as high content imaging or a content screening, uh, is uh, based on imaging uh, or microscopy based cellular assays. Uh, and uh, an investigator, a researcher, can use this, uh, these assays uh, to test the effect of one or more experimental treatments by uh, measuring uh, phenotypic uh, changes uh, caused on the biological system. And of course, based on a phenotypic change, uh, the investigator uh, can infer uh, the activity or the activities of the experimental treatment. And this, as you can see, is not uh, very different than more traditional uh, fluorescence uh, microscopy. What really high throughput imaging uh, brings to the table uh, is the use of uh, automation at every step of the process, starting uh, from automated uh, liquid handling uh, for uh, the dispensing of experimental treatments uh, to uh, the use of high throughput uh, microscopes, microscopes for automated uh, image acquisition. And of course, all the way to the end, uh, to the use of uh, eye content image analysis uh, for uh, the automated uh, processing of uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of images. So as I uh, already mentioned, uh, HDI is extremely uh, powerful and it's extremely flexible. The same can, technique can be used in a few uh, different ways. So if we take again uh, the typical HDI workflow, uh, starting from a systematic perturbation, high throughput microscopy, high content image analysis, and then data analysis, uh, we can use it in a few different ways. In terms of systematic perturbations, uh, HDI can be used to screen libraries or collections, large collections of uh, compounds. And this was actually one of the first uses of the technique in the pharmaceutical industry uh, now more than 10 years ago. But uh, in the past 10 years, HDI has been extensively used uh, in academia and in industry uh, to screen large collections of uh, oligo uh, SRNAs uh, for the systematic uh, knockdown of gene expression and uh, to uh, run uh, reverse genetic screens to identify uh, novel cellular pathways and uh, gene function. More recently, the technique has also been used uh, to screen also uh, libraries of um, um, collections of uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, reagents. So uh, this time not to knock down uh, gene expression, but not to knock out uh, gene expression. Uh, we then have uh, high throughput uh, microscopy. Uh, we use uh, multi-well uh, micro titer plates. I'll tell you a little bit about a little a little bit more about these plates uh, later on. Uh, and then we have, again, eye content uh, image analysis. And this is where uh, things uh, can be, uh, get a little bit uh, different. So HDI can be uh, used in roughly uh, three different ways. Uh, in a screening uh, mode, which is the most uh, used of these um, uh, uses of uh, HDI. And the idea here uh, is to, uh, again, rank uh, the experimental treatments uh, based on one or few cellular features extracted by high content imaging, uh, and then uh, identify uh, experimental treatments uh, that are actually have a, a potent uh, biological uh, activity. Uh, some labs, uh, some uh, high throughput imaging cores have also used high throughput imaging uh, for profiling. And the idea here is to extract not one or a few cellular features, but to extract tens or thousands of cellular features, and then uh, use these complex uh, uh, multi-parametric data sets of cellular features uh, to uh, cluster or to identify functions of the compounds based on the results of uh, the experiment. 
And finally, uh, a use of the technique that, that HITEF uh, spearheaded in the last few years is not uh, to use it to screen uh, libraries of compounds or, or um, uh, sRNAs, uh, but rather uh, to address a few uh, precise biological questions uh, that require uh, the use of uh, unbiased uh, and precise quantification of uh, biological events, an approach that uh, we uh, termed uh, deep imaging. And this has been particularly useful uh, to precisely quantify extremely rare but uh, biologically important events uh, such as um, uh, chromosome translocations. So digging a little bit deeper into the high throughput microscopy part in the image acquisition part, as I mentioned before, the idea is to uh, grow cells and treat them in multi-well uh, microtiter plates. The most common uh, uh, use formats in academia are 96 or 384 well plates. Uh, and um, the pharmaceutical industry is actually moving to um, higher density plates, uh, such as uh, 1536 uh, well plates. And the idea is that each and every well of these plates is a separate experiment so that we can run up to uh, 384 experiments in one plate. And of course, a screen um, uh, usually has tens or hundreds of uh, these plates. And then we can use high throughput microscopes to, uh, um, we can program them uh, to automatically acquire images in each and every uh, uh, well of these multi-well uh, tighter plates, but also on multiple positions or field of view. Uh, these positions uh, are uh, predetermined, uh, but random, so we are just sampling uh, the cellular population. And then, of course, since we are using uh, fluorescence microscopes, uh, we can acquire uh, images uh, in the same field of view for uh, multiple uh, uh, spectral channels, uh, but also uh, we can section our samples uh, in the Z uh, dimension. And now, more and more often, uh, high throughput microscopes are equipped with environmental chamber units uh, to uh, perform uh, live cell experiments to acquire information about the kinetics of uh, biological uh, processes. And the truth is uh, that uh, usually uh, researchers tend to focus on this part of the equation by acquiring images for a very large uh, number of, of wells, uh, for screens, large screens, and limit the numbers of fields of view channels and really not use uh, uh, Z and time, or rather focus on a very uh, small number of wells and uh, really focus on uh, time and Z. Uh, regardless of the approach uh, chosen, uh, and, and the approach of course is entirely dependent on the biological question that, that is asked, um, high throughput microscopes can produce a very large number of images per day. Modern instruments uh, can produce up to 200,000 uh, um, uh, images uh, per day. And this means that uh, in terms of image processing, in terms of uh, extracting the information from these images, we cannot really rely on uh, manual or semi-automated uh, analysis. And uh, for this reason, and also because uh, we want our analysis to be as unbiased as possible, we take advantage of automated eye content imaging. And the idea behind high content, high content imaging uh, is to use, uh, usually in, I would say, more than 95% of the cases, uh, use a DAPI stain to identify uh, the nucleus, and use the DAPI channel uh, to segment uh, nuclei, so to identify mm -hmm. single cells uh, in the images. And then if other uh, uh, appropriate uh, fluorescent markers are present, uh, to uh, segment other uh, subcellular compartments, such as the cytoplasm, spots, vesicles, and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, uh, w when we have these compartments, uh, we can actually extract uh, quantitative numerical cellular features uh, that describe uh, these uh, cellular uh, compartments. And then, of course, these numerical cellular features uh, can be used uh, to, uh, again, run compounds, um, uh, run uh, profiling experiments or uh, deep imaging experiments. What are these cellular features? Uh, modern high content imaging software can extract up to a thousand of these features. They fall mainly into six classes. Uh, the most common class uh, uh, of cellular features is counts. So we can count uh, nuclei, we can count uh, spots. Um, 
but also, uh, since we're using fluorescence microscopy, we can uh, measure the position of subcellular objects or the distance between subcellular objects, uh, such as, for example, uh, two spots in two different colors uh, inside a nucleus, as I'll show you in a little bit. A uh, very common class of cellular features measured by content imaging is intensity. Uh, we can measure uh, differences in uh, intensity between, for example, a negative and a positive control, and we can do it at a single cell uh, level. We can also measure uh, changes in texture or in the uh, intracellular uh, distribution of uh, fluorescence markers, changes in morphology, shape, area, and finally also measure uh, relational properties, uh, such as, for example, uh, the clustering of uh, nuclei in multinucleated uh, giant cells or syncytia. In terms of instrumentation, I mentioned automated uh, liquid handling. I'll go very briefly over uh, this part. Uh, the two main classes of instruments uh, that we and other facilities use are uh, liquid handlers uh, for the reformatting, uh, stamping, and uh, dispensing of uh, libraries, and plate washers and dispenser uh, to automate uh, immunofluorescence or uh, DNA or RNA uh, fish uh, protocols. High throughput microscopes are really the workhorses of high throughput imaging facilities, uh, and this is the, our, our uh, instrument. Um, our instrument is a, a NIPCO spinning disk confocal microscope. It's equipped with four uh, laser uh, lines, so we can acquire up to uh, four um, spectral channels, a variety of high numerical aperture uh, objectives, very important, uh, rapid, very fast out of focus uh, laser uh, to keep uh, the uh, constantly uh, the focus uh, during image acquisition. Large SMOS uh, cameras. Nowadays, this is a very important feature because we want to uh, go fast, acquire images uh, of a lot of cells in a single uh, shot. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the throughput of these instruments is is very high. So. Uh, the theoretical limit uh, for this instrument is about 2.4 terabytes of uh, data generated on a per uh, day basis. And finally, and I won't talk about the, uh, this today uh, for the projects, but uh, we and others are using high throughput imaging uh, for live cell experiments uh, more and more. In terms of um, what to think about uh, when thinking about a high throughput imaging assays, uh, the first and most important question is, what is the biological question? Um, this is not very different than any other um, uh, experiment, but it's very, very important to uh, decide from the very beginning what is that we want to know, what is that we are asking, because this will determine uh, all the following uh, steps. So once a researcher has a biological question, uh, the, next, uh, the next question is, what are the fluorescent markers uh, that we are going to choose? Um, again, as I mentioned, we have four channels. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, the, the, the fluorophores are not uh, overlapping. And um, one really need, needs to be careful uh, to choose not just fluorophores, but appropriate uh, cellular markers. Uh, do I have a cellular proteins that uh, can be uh, labeled and can really uh, work as a proxy for the cellular process that I'm studying. Um, what is the cellular phenotype that I want to measure uh, with high throughput imaging? Once I have the cellular marker, what am I measuring? <coughs> is this a change in fluorescence intensity? Uh, is it a translocation from the cytoplasm to the nucleus? Is it the formation of spots? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, what cell line I'm going to use. Um, uh, in the past, uh, we and others, I must confess, have used um, um, mostly immortalized uh, or transformed cell lines because they're easy to use. But these days, and especially for uh, more uh, disease-driven uh, projects, uh, the choice of a physiologically relevant, a disease-relevant uh, cellular system is uh, very important. Can my cell can my cell, uh, cell line uh, grow uh, attached or adherent? Uh, this is not absolutely necessary, but it's usually a desirable property. 
uh, can it grow in NT6 or 304 well plates or even 1536 well plates? Strange things happen uh, in miniaturized formats. Um, and also, and very important, uh, the fact that uh, a researcher can, can, can see and can clearly detect a phenotype uh, with, with the human eye doesn't necessarily mean that the computer uh, can see it. And so one important question is, can I actually use eye content imaging uh, to reliably uh, measure uh, the phenotype? And last, and, and it's actually the most important thing, is controls. Controls, controls, controls. Do I have technical controls for my assay? And, and, and extremely important, do I have biological controls for my assay? And uh, these are very important, not just for the screening part, but also and especially for the assay uh, development part. In terms of fluorescent markers, what can we use uh, in high throughput imaging? This is pretty much, to a certain extent, uh, is, is, is pretty much like fluorescence microscopy. Uh, we can use fluorescence in situ hybridization uh, to uh, identify and localize um, uh, nucleic acids, uh, DNA and RNA, as indicated uh, here. Uh, we can use uh, uh, fluorescently, uh, um, genetically engineered uh, fluorescent uh, proteins uh, to uh, label specific protein markers uh, in the cell. Uh, we can use uh, fluorescent dyes um, that uh, can specifically uh, label subcellular structures, such as in this very simple example, uh, DNA, such as DAPI and, and HEX, uh, stains that uh, were mentioned uh, yesterday. And finally, of course, it's also possible to use uh, immunofluorescence uh, to detect uh, endogenous uh, proteins. Now, uh, a few examples about assay development. This is not an exhaustive uh, list of things that uh, need to be uh, checked. I usually recommend uh, users of the facility to first uh, test, a, do a run a very simple uh, experiment. How many cells do I need to seed uh, for my uh, experiment. What you're seeing here is a test uh, for mm -hmm. uh, cell seeding number of a colorectal cancer cell line, HCT116. Uh, and what you're seeing here is uh, titration of the number of cells uh, seeded uh, for the experiment. What I'm showing you here, uh, these are U2S cells. It's our reference uh, cell line. So this is an ideal cell density. There is enough cells in the cell uh, in the field of view. Again, as I mentioned before, we are randomly sampling, so we want to have enough cells uh, in the field of view. But they're not uh, too close together, not too um, butting onto each other, so that uh, the uh, high content image analysis software can actually reliably uh, segment them. For the test cell line, this experimental condition here, um, to, uh, magnified here, this is too sparse. We don't have enough cells. Well, we could run an assay this way. We would have to um, acquire more fields of view uh, <laughs> per uh, well, and this would uh, in, uh, imply that um, the assay would run uh, for a much longer time. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, this condition, in these conditions, the cells are too packed, uh, too dense. Um, set aside biological problems with this condition, uh, the software would not be able uh, to reliably uh, segment them. And this cell line is not an ideal cell line in terms of um, uh, growth properties. Uh, but this is an experimental condition that I would deem acceptable. So we can, uh, we can work with this. Yesterday, um, uh, a lot was said, uh, rightly so, I think, about uh, fluorescence, uh, the, the optimization of immunofluorescence uh, uh, protocols. I throughput uh, imaging is really fluorescence microscopy at, at, at its core. And so a researcher absolutely needs uh, to optimize uh, fluorescence staining uh, protocols, whether it's fish, whether it's immunofluorescence, even when it's just uh, fluorescence uh, proteins. And what I'm showing you here, it's just an example of um, a DNA fish uh, with a uh, host hybridization amplification step uh, where we just titrated the amount of uh, primary uh, oligo, uh, as indicated here, uh, and uh, amplification time. And this is a slide that I should have not prepared because it's impossible to see it from afar. Uh, but 
uh, what we can actually see uh, is that in this condition, uh, we see the appearance of exactly two uh, spots per cell, uh, which is the expected behavior of these probes since these are diploid cells. So we can actually see the two sister uh, loci uh, in the nucleus of uh, almost uh, every cell. Another very important step uh, uh, for um, sRNA-based screens is the titration of uh, transfection uh, reagents and the titration of uh, sRNAs uh, themselves uh, to test for efficacies of the sRNA and also to test uh, for um, the toxicity of the transfection reagent itself. And what you see here, it's uh, two different experimental conditions, two different concentrations of uh, sRNAs. T uh, titration of uh, the transfection reagent that was used in this experiment, and of course, controls. So we have a no sRNA, two negative, different uh, negative controls, and two uh, positive controls. Positive controls here are two sRNAs that are, are expected to kill cells. This is a phenotype, like many others. It's actually a pretty simple phenotype to measure. We can actually just quantify the number of cells that we can image on a per well basis. What you can see here, and uh, pretty much as expected, if we increase the concentration of transfection reagent, uh, even in the absence of sRNA, we get uh, toxicity. So this is not good. On the other hand, though, by running this experiment, we can identify conditions uh, where just by transfecting the, SR, uh, the negative uh, control sRNA, we get no toxicity, but we do get uh, killing of 80, 85% of the cells when using the positive controls, both at 20 and 50 nanomolar, and also for both. Um, uh, positive controls. And so this is just, uh, just an example uh, to show A, the importance of controls, and B, the importance of titrating uh, your uh, reagents. Good. So now having gone through s at least some of the steps during assay development, I want to show you a couple of, of practical examples of how heterocode imaging has been used at, at HITIF. Um, I think that our main asset is not necessarily our instruments or our software, but it's actually our collaborators. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have uh, the, the fortune of working with people that have <laughs> very good uh, uh, very good ideas. And in particular, HITIF is embedded with the Laboratory of Receptor Biology and Gene Expression at NCI. And uh, one of the main questions that, that is addressed uh, at uh, LRBG uh, is nuclear architecture. As many of you know, uh, the mammalian cell nucleus is non-randomly organized, uh, spatially organized uh, in 3D, and this organization is hierarchical. Uh, the genome is already organized in uh, regions of uh, active uh, gene expression, non-coding gene expression, non-coding and uh, inactive. And transcriptional activity and epigenetic marks uh, drive the formation of chromatin uh, domains uh, in 3D, and uh, through mechanisms that are still poorly understood, uh, but under a very active investigation, these chromatin domains can first form uh, super domains and uh, then uh, entire spatially separated uh, chromosome ter territories. And finally, uh, the nucleus is um, um, enveloped uh, by a proteinaceous structure, the nuclear lamina, uh, which provides um, architectural support, structural support, and also provides a layer of regulations for important uh, nuclear processes. Uh, and just as an aside, the importance of uh, nuclear architecture, genomic uh, architecture, it's important, uh, the importance of, of uh, these processes underlie by the fact that several of the components involved in uh, maintaining reg uh, nuclear architecture are actually uh, mutated or malfunctioning in important diseases such as cancer or aging. Uh, for example. So how do we study uh, uh, nuclear architecture? Uh, what I'll show you uh, today, again, is two stories. The first one is about uh, using high throughput imaging to study and quant precisely quantify genomic loss of interactions. Historically speaking, uh, nuclear architecture has taken advantage of two families of technique uh, to um, uh, study uh, how things work. 
The first class, the 300 uh, pound gorilla in the room, is uh, the family of um, ligation, proximity uh, based ligation assays, such as uh, chromosome conformation uh, capture. These techniques uh, are based on next generation sequencing. I won't go into the details. But one of the major advantages of these techniques, and, and they, have, they have really revolutionized the field in the past 10 years, is the fact that they uh, provide a genome-wide view of nuclear architecture uh, at very high resolution, uh, down to uh, 1 uh, KB. Um, historically speaking, microscopy has also been used to study uh, nuclear architecture. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, DNA fission, to a certain extent, also immunofluorescence, have been essential uh, to uh, study this process uh, from uh, much uh, longer uh, ago. Um, and as you can see here, uh, with DNA fish, uh, we can see, we can precisely identify the position of genomic loci as spot-like uh, features. Uh, and of course, we can label uh, multiple loci in, multi in multiple different colors. One of the main disadvantages of uh, um, uh, microscopy uh, in this sense is the fact that, and in particular DNA fish, is that um, this is an extremely laborious and uh, low throughput uh, technique. On the other hand, microscopy has the incredible advantage of providing a, really a single cell view of nuclear architecture, even a single uh, locus view of nuclear architecture, which is something that up until now it's been extremely difficult, not impossible, but extre extremely difficult uh, to do uh, with um, uh, 3C and IC uh, techniques. The fact that uh, DNA fish is a low throughput technique actually changed a few years ago, uh, thanks to the incredible work of Sigal uh, Shakar, a postdoc in the Misteli lab at NCI, who managed to miniaturize uh, DNA fish assays in a 380 world plate. Uh, and so what she did was to couple uh, DNA fish to high throughput imaging and to the automated detection of uh, these DNA fish spots in the nucleus for the automated uh, identification and positioning of millions of uh, these uh, loci. And the ways that she used uh, this technique that uh, she referred to as a high throughput position mapping or heat map was uh, to measure the radial distance of genomic loci uh, from uh, the nuclear uh, envelope. And she ran uh, um, an SRNA screen using uh, this assay, but this has been published and I won't talk about this today. This technique, though, um, really uh, presented us with the opportunity to bridge the gap uh, between the biochemical techniques in IC and uh, fluorescence microscopy. As I mentioned, uh, IC, the 3C family of technique, is genome-wide and high resolution, but cannot measure physical distances. It only measures uh, interaction frequencies. Uh, it, for the most part, it can only measure pairwise interactions, and most importantly, uh, for the most part, it only measures averages of interaction frequencies over millions of cells. On the other hand, um, uh, fluorescence microscopy, DNA fish, is candidate based, has somehow limited resolution, but has the great advantage of being able to measure physical distances. Uh, it's also possible to measure uh, cluster interactions of up to three foci uh, per time, three spots per time and provides a single cell, single allele view of uh, genome architecture. And for this, region, for this reason, uh, Elizabeth Finn, an extremely uh, talented postdoc, again from the Misteli lab, decided to use HIMA to systematically measure relative distances uh, between uh, genomic loci uh, labeled uh, by DNA fish. And what she did was to actually get data sets of high C data uh, and uh, try to see what the correlation was between high C and uh, hip map and, and, and DNA fish. So as an example here, uh, she chose uh, this locus here, and she uh, decided to measure the distances to two loci that are genomically equidistant on either side, but have a very uh, different high C reading. So the way to read these uh, numbers is that uh, this interaction is a lower I see score than uh, this region here, which basically means that at least as measured by high C, 
uh, this interaction is stronger uh, than this interaction here. So she used IMAP to label uh, these loci and measure uh, the interactions in thousands of cells per experimental condition. And what's shown here, just for this distance, is uh, these, these pairs, it's actually the distributions of distances. And what you can see here, it's two interesting things. Uh, the first one uh, is that uh, interactions are not, uh, do not cluster in just one point, but it's actually a fairly broad uh, distribution of distances for a certain uh, pair, for a certain, a certain interaction pair. Meaning that not all the cells, not in all the cells, those two loci are uh, interacting. And this is not something that we can measure with high C. The second important feature is that even though, luckily, uh, the, the, the interaction pair uh, that gave a higher uh, high C value, it's actually in closer proximity uh, than the one that interacted at, at a lower frequency as measured by high C, there are cells uh, where potentially the, the locus uh, that is interacting at lower frequency by high C, it's actually closer than the locus that is interacting at higher frequency. So there is extremely, there's an extreme heterogeneity and variability in the cellular population. And this is something that cannot be measured by high C. This was just one or two interactions pairs. Um, Elizabeth uh, went and actually generated uh, DNA fish probes and measure uh, the interaction frequencies by heat map with hundreds of uh, these uh, probes. And uh, with this uh, fairly uh, large data set um, of um, interaction uh, pairs, she could start asking questions, some of the open questions in, in, in the field. The first one is, do high C measurements actually correlate with physical uh, measurements? The second is, as I mentioned before, uh, how prevalent are these interactions in the population? If an interaction has very high C levels, does this mean that it happens in all the cells or only in a few cells? Um, we have, as I mentioned before, two sister loci for each locus in the genome for the most part. If one interacts, does the other one interact as well in the, in the same cell? And do clustering interactions actually happen? So to answer the first two questions, and I won't show all, all the data, uh, this is in uh, the pre-publication stage, the, to answer the first question, um, the high C measurements and heat map or uh, DNA fish measurements actually correlate uh, pretty strongly, and this is good. The second uh, thing that is immediately apparent uh, from the y-axis here uh, is that even uh, the strongest interaction happens in a, a usually uh, not uh, more uh, than 60% uh, of the cells. Again, indicating that there is cellular uh, heterogeneity. To answer the third question, um, do um, uh, sister loci actually affect each other? The answer is generally no. Uh, alleles uh, are uh, independent uh, with one uh, notable uh, exception. And uh, clusters of uh, different genes in uh, different colors um, appear at an extremely uh, low frequency uh, and also uh, are uh, independent. So to summarize this first part, uh, heat map and high throughput imaging have been uh, used to answer a specific uh, question uh, in a high throughput uh, manner. Now, let me switch gears and tell you about a use of high throughput imaging for a screening application. I'll tell you a little bit about an RNA, RNAi screen uh, to, for suppressors of the progeria uh, phenotype. Atchison gifford progeria syndrome, or GPS, it's a premature aging, aging disease. Uh, patients are uh, uh, usually develop uh, the first signs of the disease uh, between the first and the second uh, year, and they rapidly uh, progress and usually die in their teens due to cardiovascular defects and uh, strokes. AGPS, it's a genetic disease, and at a molecular level, it's caused by a recurrent de novo point mutation in the laminae gene. Laminae is an essential component of the nuclear uh, lamina, which, as I said before, it's, uh, it, it maintains the structure integrity of the nucleus and regulates uh, several uh, nuclear uh, pathways. 
And the outcome of the, this pathogenic mutation is the production of a mutant version of lamin A, which is usually referred to as progerin. And progerin acts as a, a dominant negative in the cells of a GPS patients to cause some striking uh, nuclear defects. The most uh, evident uh, being the fact that the nuclei of EGPS uh, patients uh, tend to be uh, misfolded. Shape is not the only hallmark of a GPS uh, nuclei. Um, the Misteli lab and others, uh, now quite some time ago, actually showed uh, that uh, other essential components of the nuclear envelope uh, are not regulated uh, in uh, the cells of a GPS patients. Uh, the endogenous uh, DNA damage uh, response is actually activated, as shown here by increased, an increased number and intensity of phosphate 2 x and 53-BP1 uh, spots, a known marker of the DDR. Uh, and other heterochromatin, uh, and heterochromatin uh, proteins are actually uh, downregulated. So while the markers have been known for quite some time, Actual molecular mechanisms that lead from the production of progerin to the downstream effects are uh, not uh, very well understood. And in particular, uh, not many treatments or many, um, many experimental manipulations are not known uh, that can actually uh, stop the progression from a healthy state uh, to an AGPS state. And so Nark Rubin, a uh, 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 postdoctoral fellow uh, in the Misteli lab, uh, decided to set up an assay uh, to be used uh, to test live of SRNAs uh, to identify potential suppressors of, of this phenotype. In order to do so, he established a cell line uh, uh, starting uh, from a wild type, a normal, uh, a normal uh, cell line that can be, uh, uh, in, that can inducibly express with doxycycline an AGP version of the mutated uh, progerin protein <coughs> Uh, that, as I mentioned before, it's a dominant negative, and uh, the, just the expression of GFP per gene uh, can lead to the formation of uh, the nuclear phenotypes. And the idea was, of course, to measure these phenotypes in a precise manner with high throughput imaging. So NAR generated the cell lines. These are just controls. Uh, he could induce the expression of the GFP per gene in uh, uh, levels comparable to the endogenous uh, version of uh, laminae. And also, and extremely importantly, he could uh, see a reduction in nuclear envelope components, heterochromatin markers, and an activation of the DNA damage response. And so armed with this assay, he decided uh, to run the uh, RNAi screen. And the idea here, uh, once again, is to uh, induce uh, a progene, EGFP per gene with doxycycline and at the same time transfect with the sRNA library. And the idea here is to find genes that, when knocked down, uh, can actually preserve uh, the healthy state, and so that we have suppressors of uh, AGPS. As I mentioned before, controls, controls, controls. Uh, NARD uh, was very diligent uh, in this. As shown here are some of the technical and biological controls, uh, expression of GFP per gene. Of course, when he treated cells with doxycycline, he could induce per gene. Uh, Importantly, he had a biological control in an sRNA against the GFP tag per se, so he could at the same time induce and knock down the expression of progene, and this was a positive control. As you can see here, knockdown of uh, uh, GFP uh, abolishes the expression of progene, but importantly, from a biological standpoint, what you could see was that uh, when he looked at both lamin A and gamma h 2 x transfection of the positive control completely abolished the, expression, the, the effects of GFP progene. And so armed with this assay, we screened the library, and long story short, this was a library of about 320 sRNAs uh, involved in a protein ubiquitination and protosomal destructions of proteins. Uh, and he identified seven uh, reliable hits that were uh, validated. He focused his attention on this gene here, <coughs> okay. uh, Candy 1, for reasons that will become apparent in a slide or two. So Candy 1. Uh, Knockdown of Candy 1, importantly, uh, set aside the fact that it was validated in secondary screens, not only uh, caused um, um, uh, partial uh, rescue of uh, gamma H3X and uh, lamin B, uh, but also caused a partial rescue of uh, the other AGPS uh, markers. 
in uh, the normal cells uh, in uh, expressing uh, GFP per gene. More importantly, though, uh, knockdown of candy one actually reversed uh, the effects of progerin in actual patient uh, cells. And some of you uh, might have noticed that a knockdown of uh, candy one actually reduces the levels of uh, GFP progerin by about uh, 50%. Uh, but uh, NART uh, ran some controls by inducing uh, EGP per G in a 50% of the levels. Um, but as you can see here, uh, this was not uh, sufficient to rescue uh, the defects, indicating that a knockdown of candy one is actually acting on another uh, yet unidentified uh, cellular uh, factor. It's not just the fact that there is less GFP per G. What is this yet unidentified cellular uh, factor? And this is where uh, uh, NARC actually scoured the literature and found uh, that uh, Candy one is part of a multi-protein uh, complex, including HIP1, RBX1, and, and CAL3. And one of the targets of these, it's actually an E3 ubiquitin ligase uh, complex, one of the main targets of this complex is the NRF2 transcription factor. And what happens is that uh, uh, in normal conditions, so in the absence of uh, prototoxic or uh, oxidative stress, uh, this protein complex ubiquitinates uh, NRF2 and targets it, targets it for uh, protosomal destruction, so the levels of NRF2 are low. In the presence of prototoxic or oxidative stress, uh, NRF2 is uh, stabilized and can actually translocate uh, to the nucleus where it binds uh, antioxidants, uh, uh, sequence-specific antioxidants uh, responsive uh, elements uh, that uh, then lead to the uh, transcription activations of a battery of uh, protective antioxidant uh, genes. And NRF2 was, was particularly interesting because it had been previously uh, involved uh, in aging-related pathways in a model organism. And since progeria, it's um, aging-related uh, disease, this was the link uh, to uh, then look more into uh, NRF2. First thing that uh, um, uh, NAR did was to test whether knockdown of candy one in his cells actually led uh, to an upregulation on NRF2, and this was indeed the case. Uh, and then through a, he went through a series of experiments that I won't show you today, uh, but he found out that what happens is that when uh, GFP per gene is expressed, NRF2, uh, it's actually sequestrated by GFP per gene and uh, titrated away uh, from its target promoters. And so what you, the, the end point result from a molecular standpoint, it's uh, that uh, NRF2 target genes are actually downregulated uh, in a, a GPS cells. As I mentioned before, these are antioxidant protective genes. Uh, and so the end result, uh, or what NART uh, hypothesized back then was that the absence of these genes might actually lead to the progeria um, uh, defects. So, uh, first thing that NARC tested was to knock down NRF2 itself uh, and see if he could recapitulate the AGFP, the uh, progeria phenotypes. As you can see here, uh, this was the case both in normal cells and in progeria patient cells. Knockdown of NRF2 actually exacerbated uh, the phenotypes. But most importantly, uh, NART was actually cap uh, capable to rescue uh, the defects uh, and so to first uh, reduce uh, the levels of reactive oxygen uh, species in progeria patient cells which are higher uh, than uh, normal cells and it could completely revert uh, this phenotype by <laughs> expressing a constitutive active version of uh, NRF2 and most importantly he was capable of, um, of rescuing the progeria defects in uh, progeria patient cells, again, by expressing a uh, constitutive version of uh, NRF2. And so, thanks to the use of high-throughput imaging, NARC could uh, come up uh, with a model uh, where NRF2 normally protects cells with, uh, from oxidative uh, stress in the presence of uh, progerin. Progerin titrates away NRF2. NRF2 cannot protect from oxidative stress, and this leads to a GPS defects. And of course, the way that this factor was identified at the beginning was that by knocking down candy one, NRF2 is partially rescued. So, to end, uh, I want you to go away with uh, three main messages. 
The first one, uh, again, being that HCI is an extremely powerful and flexible technique. Uh, and it, as the title of the presentation say, it can be used to systematically integrate cellular pathways. And today I showed you cellular pathways that are related to nuclear architecture, uh, but it can be basically used for any question that can be addressed uh, with microscopy. More in detail, um, we at HITIF have used um, uh, HDI in two slightly different uh, flavors. The first one, deep imaging for the large scale precise measurement of rare biological events at suborganelle uh, scale, scale. And this, of course, has some advantages with, from, uh, with existing techniques. And then, in a more traditional way, uh, it's also possible to use HDI for screening applications. Uh, not only for the identification, but also and especially for the characterization of no novel cellular factors and uh, molecular mechanisms. And so I want to end by uh, thanking the, the, the people, our collaborators, the people that actually did the work and, and drove the, the, the projects from, from the biological side. Um, shout out to Elizabeth and, and, and Nard under uh, the guidance of uh, Tom Nistelli and then other members of uh, ITIF. And I haven't talked today about uh, other projects, but they're uh, really essential. And of course, uh, funding is entirely provided uh, by the intramural uh, uh, NIH uh, program. And with this, I thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Super nice.